Welcome to the HBOT News Network. And in this conversation, um, we have a, um, we're delighted to have, I should say, somebody that I would call the hyperbaric oxygen uh, industries historian. Um, and Tom Fox, who um, is based out of Montreal, Canada, has such a wealth of knowledge of the history of hyperbaric oxygen that it, to me, it just boggles the mind why this has not been embraced for, uh, I would say, hundreds of years. And so, so we're going to dive into that. And the history of hyperbarics, I think, leads you to some of the conclusions that, that, um, that, that I have possibly and some of the, the uh, industry experts and leaders that they've seen for so long. So welcome, Tom, and appreciate you being here for this conversation. I, I, I just am in awe of your operation here. I, I think I've had... Uh, the opportunity to look at everything that's at Ex Devita and uh, the work that's being done there, and it's just amazing. Uh, the innovation uh, that Hyperbarics has taken in the Ex Devita clinic uh, could benefit Hyperbarics as a whole. Well, so I, I, I'm honored to be here. Thank you. Well, we appreciate that, Tom. And, and uh, at the HBOT News Network, one of the things, one, our, our real mission here is to just educate the market on Hyperbarics as a whole because we understand there's so many clinics out there that are um, struggling with resources and, and, and the inability to really get the word out. And so we, we're doing this for the industry, as you know, the hyperbaric um, industry needs a news platform. And so um, I'm so grateful that you're gonna participate or you are participating in it. Ex Vita, you are the safety director. I know officially that's, that's one of your roles that you're playing there. Um, and uh, and what I you know love about you know talking with you especially is just you give such insights into where hyperbaric has been and who who really were the originators and and I sort of on the cuff say hyperbaric oxygen's been around since the second day <laughs> and people sort of look perplexed and I'm just like you know Genesis you know the atmosphere oxygen on the scene. Um, it's that patent's long run out, so there's not a lot of opportunity in some intellectual property on this one, and maybe that's one of the one of the issues. Um, and and uh, clearly, there's a lot of patents in medicine today, and trying to patent everything to to increase margins. And so so, the history. So so where do we start? I mean, there's so much, and I'm going to put that on you. Like, what what was the most intriguing thing about the history of hyperbarics that you'd like to share? One of the things that I will tell you is hyperbarics has been around for a long time as a clinical offering. So I was surprised to see how much it was out there and how unchanged it's been uh, since the 1800s. 1830 is the first clinical uh, use of hyperbarics. Now, it wasn't hyperbaric oxygen at that time. It was hyperbaric air. Still, the results they were reporting were incredible. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the first hyperbaric chamber came around as early as the 1660s, and that was uh, put together by a clergyman named Nathaniel Henshaw, uh, Nathaniel Henshaw, excuse me. But uh, he believed that the application of uh, pressure was good to treat acute conditions, but the uh, application of hypobaria was for chronic conditions. That kind of is interesting because now we're finding that the cyclic use of hyperbaria or relative hyperbaria uh, and hypobaria, uh, it, it's, uh, it's intriguing in what it's doing uh, from the standpoint of physiology. Mm. And uh, Dr. Fratty and his group have been at the forefront in, in looking at Hyperbarics. Now they have the the number of treatments that they can do that, uh, but they have an incredible complex over in in Tel Aviv that's actually putting uh, hyperbaric uh, education or hyperbaric studies at the forefront. Where uh, you know the commitment has not been there, or it's been very limited commitment. What you will see is uh, throughout our history that they've used slightly pressurized room air. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you today because the slightly pressurized room air has consistently been assumed not to have any 
effect. So it's been offered up as a control in many of the studies. It's like the placebo. The placebo. And, and so when and the placebo they, helps and the, the treatment helps, that's, it, what, that's giving them a mechanism or a strategy to say, yeah, it's in their heads. Right. Yeah. And in fact, a lot of times they attribute the use of hyperbarics under pressure to, to psychology. Well, they thought it worked. It's the, it's the participation effect. Mm. Uh, that's been assumed Again, the word assumption and assume uh, is something that is critical in looking at the hyperbaric literature. Um, so uh, Friday, he coined this phrase, the hyperbaric or hyperbaric hypoxic paradox, something like that. Yeah, and, and they brought that around. And, but in, in reality, if you actually look at it, that's similar to something that's been presented by the Russians uh, and just wasn't publicized. So Dr. Freddy's brought it to light, and not only has he brought it to light, he's put it into practice. So that's, that's kind of an interesting sideline, and, and it's changing the way we look at the application of air brakes mm. within our protocols. Uh, the use of air brakes was thought to fight oxygen toxicity. Now it's used to establish a relative hypoxia mm -hmm. uh, without going into hypoxic conditions. So, so from, from the standpoint of layman's terms, got to paraphrase that, you're breathing pure oxygen and all of a sudden now you're breathing air. Your body says, oh, oxygen's depleting, you're suffocating, all these mechanisms occur in, you know, in your physiology, and then the body's like, oh, no, everything's okay. <laughs> we have plenty of oxygen. Right. And so that, that five-minute air break triggers that, and then he's doing it, I think, three or four times in a 90-minute treatment. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, and it ends up being therapeutic. Mm, interesting, yeah. So, so, okay, back to the 1800s. We pulled up this article on your tablet, and uh, I know it's been around. It's, it's a more than 100-year-old article. I'd, I'd really like you to share that if you could. Uh, this is uh, from a series of articles that appeared in the, the British Medical Journal, and uh, it, it's dated April 18, 1885. Uh, it's a series of lectures that was done by a doctor, Theodore Williams, and the, this is his paraphrase, well, it's uh, an excerpt from the first lecture he gives, and he says, the use of atmospheric air under different degrees of barometric pressure in the treatment of disease is one of the most important advances in modern medicine. When we consider the simplicity of the agent, the exact method by which it is applied, and the precision with which it can be regulated to the requirements of each individual, we are astonished that in England, this method of treatment has been so little used. Yeah, so there you have it. So this is 150 years ago nearly, right, or 40 years ago, and they're just taking air and putting you under pressure, and it's, it's now medical treatment that's a breakthrough, and they're not using it then. And so here we are, 140 years later. Yep, and it, it, we've been on the main or the cutting edge of medicine for almost 200 years. Yeah. And that's interesting. Um, yeah, it, this was intuitive, and, and, and what frustrates me is when the hyperbaric physicians in the community, the UHMS, says, well, slightly pressure air, it's room air. It's a placebo, it's a control, it doesn't, it's not therapeutic. Um, that's, that's the standard by which all hyperbaric studies have been uh, regulated on. So it brings into question, how do we structure our studies? What are we comparing it against? No matter what you look at, the hyperbaric studies almost have the same exact write-up, okay? It compares two slightly pressurized room air and a treatment pressure. Both groups, both patient populations being treated, improved from baseline. However, there was no differentiation between the groups, so therefore it's considered a negative study, okay? It's a setup. We've seen that with cerebral palsy. We've seen that with each of the brain studies, uh, the traumatic brain injury studies within the military, even though we can document that they have improvement. 
Well, you just point out 140 years ago, we knew it wasn't a placebo. Exactly. So, the, so the, this is so. I, I guess it's it's hard to fathom that standard of care doesn't really care about the outcome of the patient. It's 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 tragic. It, and the, what's even more tragic is that hyperbarics itself can be cost effective when it's delivered. Uh, the problem is when we put it in a for profit system, then it the treatment itself then gets inflated, the cost gets inflated, and then it's eventually they look at it and if you inflate the cost too much, then it becomes, becomes cost ineffective. You know, it gives the impression of being too costly to do this. Timing is a factor. The, the closer into an injury that you can give this, the better, and the more effective it is, and the less number of treatments that you have to do. Well, you, you, so you're in the 1800s, so now let's fast forward because um, we can go. One, one of the well-known ones I'd like to bring up. It's it's the biggest chamber, at least I'm aware of, the Cunningham ball. Maybe you tell you tell us a little bit about Dr. Cunningham because he he clearly saw the the benefits and and basically risked his whole life on it, and and his life savings certainly and. Well, the, the thing is with Dr. Cunningham, now Dr. Cunningham was an anesthesiologist uh, by trade. He invented circuits that are still in use and still patented and use by hyperbaric or, or anesthesiology. So in the 1918s, with the last pandemic, he made the observations that there was a higher mortality rate when you went to Denver as opposed to when you were at sea level. Less oxygen. Less oxygen. So what he did was he formed- uh, I'm sorry, he less, less pressure. He, he the same oxygen, less pressure. Well, it ended up being less oxygen too because the, as the pressure goes up, the oxygen content goes down. Like if we look at right now, you and I are sitting here. The we're at sea level. We're at sea level. Our dose of oxygen is 159.6 millimeters of mercury if we assume that the total atmosphere is 760. Okay? Once we increase the atmospheric pressure or decrease the atmospheric pressure, okay, if we change the oxygen uh, dosage that we're getting. That's why flying these casualties during, right after they've been injured and especially by blast, flying them could be detrimental because they're going from a area to a hypoxic area, and it's not relative hyper, uh, hypoxia. Uh, that led a group that I was with uh, during the conflict, the American Association for Hyperbaric Awareness, to propose to the U.S. military to develop a hyperbaric stretcher. In fact, we came up with a... a a model of it that was made out of mylar uh, that could use the OBOG system to deliver a sea level evacuation even though the planes were flying at between 6,500 and 8,000 feet. So that that was one of the things. Now I, I'm kind of a hyperbaric mutt. I, I've well, so let, let, me, let, me, let me come back to that because I, I think I don't want to shift gears to dose without really understanding it for my benefit and that is that we're in, in where we are at this point we're at 21% approximate oxygen, and then right. we have nitrogen, some argon, and right. mostly nitrogen, right? So, so when you go to Denver, is it still 21% of the atmosphere? It's still 21%, okay, that, but, what, but your was, dose goes down. The dose. So you're talking dose. Okay. okay the Cause, do Because I wanted to make sure I did, because I, I thought it was 21%. So dose goes down. So the, the, the person with the Spanish flu was getting a low, lower dose of oxygen well, because of the lower pressure. Because of the lower pressure. Okay. That's why when you're flying in an airplane, okay, a lot of times they won't let cardiac patients fly, mm. okay, or people with pulmonary embolisms because of the lower dose. You're decreasing the oxygen by a content by about one-third. Okay, so, okay, so Cunningham, he's saving the lives it, well, of... It's interesting that uh, Dr. Cunningham actually... Uh, what he did was he treated a very wealthy individual that was on his way uh, to die. And uh, turning blue and, and uh, made a difference, saved his life. And how did he do it? Uh, just by treating with hyperbaric air. Okay. 
and the influence of hyperbaric air in a hyperbaric chamber actually made the difference. So out of gratitude, uh, in, in Cleveland, uh, the, the roller bearing baron was uh, a guy named Timken, built a hyperbaric, uh, or actually dedicated the funds. Like, at that time it was $1 million to build the hyperbaric uh, steel ball that everybody has seen. It's a uh, five-story hotel, right? It, yeah, it was six stories, and people would enter six. for for uh, almost a month or, or extended periods of time. What kind of pressure? Do you know what they what they? Put? Their their pressure was uh, negligible. Actually, it was. Uh, but the thing thing that was interesting about it is, uh, and often a criticism was, he did it to get rich. Okay, now. What do you mean uh, the pressure was negligible? Uh, negligible. It was about uh, between. Uh, it was less than one atmosphere difference. Less so, than one atmosphere. So, so it was less than thirty-three feet of equivalent seawater. Oh well, so that's like a, a mild treatment today. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So the thing is that it, it, when they said, "Okay, he uh, is going to get rich," well, his. If you actually went for therapy for a month with him, it was $300. Now that $300 included meals and a room. Uh, that's, you're not getting rich, especially if you look at $1 million at that time was worth $12 million in today's funds. So you stayed inside this ball for a month. Yeah. And, and so you're under pressure. So you have this, this dose of oxygen that's greater because pushing it into your plasma, right? And they were using air, and they had huge compressors. I mean, huge compressors. It, I can it's imagine. just amazing. Oh, yeah. And so, okay, so Cunningham Ball. So that, that kicked off the hyperbaric world. Now it's everywhere, right? Well, the, the, it, you would have thought that. But what happened was that uh, he was treating a wide variety of things that – Today, we actually, we consider off-label, but uh, still effective. Now, he was asked to explain how it worked. That's where we come into the problem, because he was saying that it was a virus that was unidentified. Uh, so he couldn't justify it by scientific standards. And it was relatively new that, that uh, U.S. medicine had moved to a scientific uh, evaluation of what was going on. They, they never emphasized science in the practice of medicine. Um, they had redone uh, the American medical uh, education in 1910, and it was in the early stages of, of that. So, uh, you know, I think uh, Professor Cunningham actually fell victim to uh, a unusual amount of scrutiny in, in what he was doing. They shut him down, I think. Yeah, they point. shut him down, and they actually sold the uh, the chamber itself for scrap uh, mm -hmm. during World War II. Yeah. I, so I, it's, it's, It was tragic to see that. Since then, there have been uh, lectures uh, on him uh, at different conferences. I've been on the vindication of Dr. Cunningham, which uh, we're seeing right now. Uh, there's a lot of... Uh, good work that's being done out there. Mm -hmm. 